Welcome to section 1.14, Biochemical Reactions. Uh, so now we're going to move a little bit more into the idea of chemistry and how it relates to biology. Uh, we've talked about a lot of these macromolecules, these polymers, the stuff that makes up living organisms, but now we're going to talk more about how we manipulate the stuff that makes us up. Essentially, like what are some of the ways in which we can take smaller pieces of matter, smaller molecules, and make bigger molecules? You know, how can we take these bigger molecules and break them down? And that idea is going to come back to chemical reactions. And so when we talk about chemical reactions, it's important because we have to realize that as biological organisms, as much as you might think biology is not supposed to be chemistry, you know, you might think, look, I'm not supposed to have to deal with, you know, math and some of the other chemistry concepts. But when it comes down to it, biology is really just applied chemistry because all of us are made up of these organic and to some degree some inorganic chemicals, and that's how we stay alive. We are a puddle of chemicals. The reason we're alive is because the puddle of chemicals that we have does the appropriate chemical reactions at the appropriate time. So this is like a symphony of chemical reactions here that keeps us alive. If they stop doing the right reactions to allow us to maintain homeostasis, to grow, to have the genetic molecules that we need to pass things on, to have the energy molecules that we need to function, if any of those things break down that are essential to life, you become just a puddle of chemicals. And then ultimately decomposers will come in, they will break your body down, and your body will not disappear in a sense. It will no longer exist as it did, but when decomposers come through, what they're going to do is modify the chemicals, the organic chemicals that made you, you, and convert them usually into smaller chemicals, and then sometimes those smaller chemicals, those monomers, uh, CO2, H2O, will then get rebuilt either by the decomposer that ate you or by plants that absorb the stuff that was given off as you were broken down. And so the molecules, the chemicals that make us up, will persist. So it can be a reassuring idea if you want to know that you have atoms and molecules in your body that likely pass through dinosaurs and mammoths and most people in history. Uh, not a lot of them, but at least a couple. So there is that kind of idea that this connects us at an atomic and a molecular level, that we have these constant influxes and outfluxes of oxygen, CO2, water. And so we have lots and lots and lots of these atoms every day that pass through our bodies. And then other organisms will have those same atoms, those same molecules in some cases, pass through their bodies and they'll manipulate them just like we did where they might add to them and use them to build something and then ultimately at some point digest it and break it back down. And so life as we know it is really just a specific way of making sure that you rearrange these organic elements, these organic molecules in such a way that you're capable of carrying out the characteristics for life. And so you'll see here we've listed our good friend Chinops just to make sure that you guys remember. So these are the most common elements in organic chemistry, but there are others. But these are some of the most common guys that if you have a lipid, you're going to have a lot of carbon and hydrogen and a little bit of oxygen. You know, you can then rearrange that where you add more oxygen, and so you ultimately have a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio, if I can draw my ratios, of carbon to hydrogen to oxygen. And by doing that, what you'll get is a carb versus a lipid. Uh, if we add nitrogen to the mix and either phosphorus or sulfur, we can get DNA and nucleic acids or proteins. If you remember, if you're talking about nucleic acids, they'll have nitrogen and phosphorus. If you talk about proteins, they'll have nitrogen and sulfur. So as we rearrange these guys and kind of add some guys into the mix, subtract some guys from the mix, we can convert things from one type of molecule to another type of molecule. We can break them down to their smaller pieces and exhale them like we do with CO2 or void them from our body via sweat or urine like we do with water. So there's this constant shifting of stuff and we need that to be alive. There's nothing wrong with that. So these processes of shifting things around, of manipulating them, of kind of adding and subtracting things chemically, that's going to be called chemical reactions. And when we look at chemical reactions, I want you guys to make sure you understand uh, that you're going to have guys that you need, guys that are going to be the ones that are reacting, that are undergoing the chemical change or the chemical reaction. And those guys will be called reactants. Makes sense. If you're being reacted or if you're reacting with something, you're a reactant. 
and then this arrow will just mean something like yields or produces or gives uh, but the idea here is this is where the actual chemical reaction is taking place and then after the chemical reaction we produce something so we will call these guys the products which once again makes sense you produce the products so in this case we have methane is what this guy CH4 is called you guys would likely know this as natural gas so if you've got a natural gas furnace or water heater or stove this is what you're using uh, in chemistry class when you guys use Bunsen burners this is what you're using and it will burn if you mix it with oxygen and apply a little bit of heat to get it going so we have oxygen here and once it burns what you're left with is carbon dioxide CO2 and water and so this process isn't going to actually make any molecules. We still have one carbon to start with over here, and we still have one carbon when we're done. We still have two times two or four oxygen atoms when we start, and we still have two plus two, so we still have four oxygen atoms when we're done. So overall, we're going to conserve the matter we have. We're just kind of shifting the chairs around, if you will, and repartnering some people that might be in those chairs. Uh, but we're not actually making or losing anything. So I might even sometimes use the term like we destroyed something. But I don't mean that we suddenly got rid of those atoms. What I mean is we rearrange those atoms so the original substance, like maybe it's a sugar, the original sugar doesn't exist anymore in that form. It's been converted to something like carbon dioxide and water, and then carbon dioxide and water can, in many cases, leave the organism. You know, once again, you can breathe out the CO2. The water can leave via a variety of processes, uh, but easy ones, once again, would be like sweat, tears, urine. Uh, so we can easily have where these molecules can be converted, and then in many cases, as a biological organism, we constantly are going to have where a lot of these chemicals are going to be going in and out of our body. And so this is why we talk about this idea that you can have atoms and molecules from a T-Rex. No problem. I guarantee you do. Because there were, A, probably quite a few T-Rexes, and they had lots and lots and lots of atoms and molecules pass through their bodies throughout their lifetime. And we have lots and lots and lots of these atoms and molecules that pass through our bodies. Every time we breathe out, we're letting loose a really large amount of CO2 molecules just from breathing out. You know, every time you go to the bathroom, you have tons of molecules that you're losing just by doing so. So we have a constant influx and outflux of chemicals into and out of our body. So it helps sometimes not to think of the fact that you have somehow fixed molecules. You know, you might have fat stored, but oftentimes even that stored fat will be burned and replaced. So it's not like our molecules tend to be that static with us. I know sometimes people like to think that if you have fat, it stays with you. And a lot of people think, you know, well, I didn't lose weight. But just because you even have something that appears to stick around doesn't mean you're not constantly replacing it. Take, for instance, your skin. You know, hopefully it seems like you always have a layer of skin. If not, see your dermatologist. Uh, but if you look at your skin and you watch closely, and some of you guys might notice this, if you have flaky skin, you're constantly losing it. We're constantly producing new skin cells as we lose the old ones as they die and basically fall off. This is how things like bloodhounds can track you, is they can detect all the stuff that's falling off of you, and they can use that to follow your scent, because they have a really good nose. And so there's this, always this churning in so many aspects of our bodies, and organisms in general, where there's this constant churning in many cases, where even stuff that we kind of take for granted that stays there, that's more permanent, is oftentimes permanent in the sense that you always have skin, unless something really bad has happened, uh, but the idea there is the skin that you have is not the same skin today that you had a week ago or a month ago and certainly not years ago. You know, that skin's been replaced many times over. It's just a gradual replacement, so we don't notice it. So there's this constant shifting of, of atoms and compounds within our bodies. And then lastly, we can go into kind of just this idea of what happens when we go through a chemical reaction. And I want you guys to realize that when we go through and change these bonds, when we rearrange stuff to get something new, so what we're looking at here is photosynthesis, where we've got carbon dioxide and water. We'll use the energy from light to give us a sugar, in this case glucose is what we call this, uh, and oxygen. And so what I want you guys to realize is when we do this process and when we change these bonds, when we rearrange the elements, even though all the same atoms, all the same elements are still there at the end, that were there at the beginning. If we change bonds at all, it's going to cause a change in characteristics. 
And so what this means is they won't be the same guys. They won't behave the same way. They're not capable of the same things. You know, CO2 is fundamentally and completely different when it comes down to how it behaves from glucose. You know, we can breathe in CO2 and we don't get any energy from it. A plant would be able to use CO2 with light energy to make something useful, to essentially make their own food. But for an animal, CO2 is a waste. Whereas glucose as an animal we can eat and we can break down. And plants in many ways can do so as well. They can also break down their sugar, but they don't have to usually worry as much about it. They don't have to eat sugar, let's put it that way, because they can make it themselves using CO2. We can't do that chemical reaction. And so the idea there is that CO2 is not interchangeable with glucose, even though we use the same molecules to make that glucose that we had at the start. So even though we shift stuff around, I want to make sure you guys realize that's going to give you someone that's going to be a new chemical. It's a chemical change, as we call it, where the new chemical has brand new properties. You can't just interchange them despite what it may superficially look like. You know, water is not the same thing as oxygen. Even though we took the oxygen, or the oxygen molecules, or the oxygen atoms, I should say, to make the oxygen molecule, even though we might have taken them from water, it's not going to have the same characteristics. So when we talk about these chemical changes, when we talk about these chemical reactions, just keep in mind that once we do the chemical reaction, we're going to end up with something different. And that something different is not necessarily going to be at all related in function, in structure, to what we started with. And so you can start off with something that ultimately is toxic or, or not useful to our body, and after a chemical reaction, come up with something that's fairly essential where you can make something like enzymes, you can make something like proteins, nucleic acids, things that we need and that benefit us greatly. And the very last thing on the bottom here, just to prove a point, uh, these are basically three different sugar molecules that all have the exact same chemical formula. So they're made up of essentially the same atoms, the same ratio of elements, but they're just assembled differently. So you can see here when we talk about glucose, you've got this double bonded O that's on the end, Okay? And then you've got ultimately three OHs that are on this right hand side. When you look at mannose, it also has a double bonded O on the end, but notice how it's got two OHs on either side. So it's not this whole three and one. So that's what we see here is kind of three and one. It's two and two. Just small shifts in just where we put OH groups. It's the same general stuff, but it's going to have different characteristics. It's a different sugar. And then fructose is also going to be probably the worst sugar of all of them at least for our health, and you can see all it's done really is just move this double bonded O just a little bit further in. It's not on the end. And so even though we, all these guys have the same chemical formula, all these guys are going to be C6H12O6, despite that, each of them will be different. We call them isomers, where each of them has their own unique characteristics. Each of them can be good or bad or neutral based upon just the way we arrange the atoms that they possess. So any type of rearrangement, even if it's not actually losing or gaining an actual element or atom, can still give you something brand new. And this should also give you appreciation of when we talk about organic chemistry and we say how diverse it is and when we say just how many possible combinations that are out there that give us so many possibilities because each new molecule can have its own unique functions. And so this means that there are a lot of molecules that either exist out there now or could exist, could essentially get assembled, that would have functions that do just about anything that we can kind of think of. So it could be new toxins or poisons, it could be new things that are antibiotics or like antibodies, uh, which allow us to either fight stuff, to poison stuff, you know, kill or heal, any of those things. New pigments, any of that stuff can happen as we rearrange these things in new ways when the DNA changes and so we get something different you know, allows us to develop this variation in life that's so important. So that's biological uh, chemical reactions that we'll be going through. We'll finish up with some more stuff involving energy and how that relates to chemical reactions coming up. I hope you enjoyed it. Have a good night.